Get over here! Flying, inhaling, stealing powers. Is there anything Kirby can't do? Well, apparently he can't make a bad game. This glob of rose-colored Play-Doh has never let me down, but which of his adventures in Dreamland is my favorite? I would have to say his return to Dreamland. Star Allies definitely wins out in terms of graphics, combo potential, and content. Ugh, so much content! But there was something fresh about Return to Dreamland when it hit the Wii. What was originally slated to be a GameCube title, Return marks the debut of this new style of Kirby gameplay, which is a lot like the old style, just with polished 3D graphics, and a myriad of moves for each copy ability reminiscent of Superstar. Also like Superstar, Return can be played co-op, but instead of just hijacking an enemy, Kirby calls upon Dreamland's finest, King DDD, Meta Knight, and the surprisingly lethal Bandana D. He's so cute, and so deadly. That's pretty much this series thing, isn't it? Or you and your friends can all pick Kirby for the ability swapping we all know and love. Yeah, Star Allies has all this and more, but maybe too much more. The combo abilities are great and creative, but they totally clown on the game's difficulty. Yes, I'm actually complaining that a Kirby game is way too easy. Return's bosses aren't exactly kingpins either, but at least they last more than a few seconds outside of some super spicy boss rush. Again, Star Allies is great, I just prefer Return, even as a single player experience. It has far more levels for one thing. And both games have great music, but while Star Allies leans more on remixed classics, Return has that main theme and freaking Grape Garden. Oh man, I love that theme. Not to mention the best final boss theme in Kirby history. And one of the best final bosses. There's also a twist in the story that, yeah, I saw coming a mile away, but it's enough to give the adventure a little bit of texture. You're actually going to these levels for a reason. Repairing an awesome starship, not just to get to the end. And you have moments like Landia, and again, that final boss. Mmm, so good! Kirby Superstar, Crystal Shards, Triple Deluxe, Planet Robobot, they all have great endings. But Return wins out for letting you experience it with your buddies or on your lonesome. It's the best total package. A delightful game that can sate any platforming appetite. Maybe even Kirby's. I had some reservations when Street Fighter V was first announced. Ultra Street Fighter IV was still pretty new, with the largest roster in the series to date. It seemed premature jumping to a new Roman numeral. I felt a little better once I started seeing some character reveals. New faces like Rashid, long lost fighters like Kadin and Mika, the classics like Zangief looking better than ever before. And then the game launched, and... oof. Kind of puts the bear in bare knuckle, a lot of features were missing, and the total number of fighters paled in comparison to its contemporaries. Capcom, it's not okay to release a game like this. Just saying. But three years and three sets of free updates later, I'm ready to call Street Fighter V a worthy successor to the legacy. As a fighting game aficionado, this series is really important to me. It's the franchise that started it all, invented the Hadouken, accidentally made combos, and while I love Third Strike for its stunning sprite-based graphics and smooth, fast-paced gameplay, Five recently knocked it out of the ring. I can appreciate what they were going for with the smaller cast, first of all. Each character feels unique, with show-stopping critical arts, V-triggers that change the rules of the game in an instant, and tons of minute details that make the competitive scene for Five really interesting to talk about. Fong brings in a new poison mechanic, Ibuki leans more into the whole ninja thing with way more kunai attacks, Kami's spiral arrowing all over the place, and there's this guy who keeps aging and de-aging. I don't know what that's about, but I like it. Finally, we could download new fighters instead of buying a whole new freaking game every time they add content. Seriously, I thought Capcom would never let that go. Even the story mode, though nothing compared to Tekken 7, has enough novelty moments that I sheepishly enjoy about it. I don't really care about your dead friend, Rashid, but Zangief just blocked a sword with his pecs! This crap is bananas! Street Fighter V's release was very mishandled, poorly timed, and more than a little manipulative when it came to our wallets, with the season mechanics constantly influencing you to buy more content. But when you get down to the punching and spin kicks, it doesn't get much better than this. Well, actually it does. I have way more fighting games to talk about. But for now, gotta love that Street Fighter. <laughs> Video games, characters, emotional experiences. This reminds me of a puzzle I once heard. 
Professor Layton and my unwound feelings. If you guys have been watching me over the last few years, you know I wear my emotions on my sleeve. I get enthralled by stories very easily, and most of all, I get way too attached to fictional characters. Yet, as I played through the first three Professor Layton games, my empathy for this well-mannered Herschel Layton kind of snuck up on me. I could talk about the game itself. Each Layton game takes you through an offbeat setting where the brilliant and easily distracted pedagogue stops at every opportunity to share a riddle. The puzzles cover a wide berth of logical conundrums that keep the mind stimulated, and all the while you're closing in on an epiphany that can explain the unlikely happenings of this unlikely town. But, you know? Great as the gameplay is, it has very little to do with why this game is ranked here. True, if the games weren't so good, I probably wouldn't have gotten so attached to Layton in the first place, but it's Layton himself that makes this series. What at first seems like a bland Sherlock ripoff takes on serious nuance over time. Not because of any kind of twist, but from just how sincere and polite he is. He's likable, jovial, familiar, even if the stories don't require him to grow as a character. That is, until Unwound Future. Perhaps the only time adding time travel made a universe better. After two games getting to know him, we hear the origin of the man beneath the hat, part of it anyway. We learn what drives him, and more importantly, what almost stops him. And... well... I cried. Few games have made me tear up, but in the closing moments of Unwound Future, I wept for this kind soul who would never hurt a fly, but despite all his intellect and charm, may never reclaim his lost love. And he loses his composure for the only time in the series, and he takes off his hat, and... <laughs> I can't, I just can't with this. Call me a drama queen, but this game hit me right in the chest, dug itself a hole, and took up permanent residence. It's a meritorious puzzle game with a lot of brains, but it's the heart that makes it one of my favorites. I admittedly didn't play much of the Donkey Kong Country trilogy back in the day. I was way too busy with Mario and Sonic at the time. I later came back around to try them, and they hold up really well, especially Donkey Kong Country 2. But it's far from my favorite outing for Mr. Kong. Years later, with Rare gone, Nintendo would get more experimental with their flagship Gorilla, particularly with Donkey Kong Jungle Beat, a beautifully weird fusion of platforming and rhythm. If the Let's Play didn't give it away, I'm a huge fan. But if I really search my feelings, it's not my favorite either. It's close, but if I were to pop in a DK game right now, it would be Donkey Kong Country Returns. Talk about a comeback. Retro Studios takes DK to his Super Nintendo roots while still doing things their own way, and it's the best of both worlds. If you've never played a country game before, here's how I'd explain it. You know how Mario games are good because the controls are really tight? Well, Donkey Kong is really smooth. DK feels like he has some real weight to him, fitting given his species, but with a little momentum, you'll be barreling through levels and leveling through barrels. The somersault is back, including DK's inexplicable ability to jump out of a roll mid-air, plus a new emphasis on gripping onto climbable surfaces. While the old games had good level design, Return feels more free to ape the design choices from the Rare Air era and iterate on them, making them smoother and punching up the action. Each stage is beautiful and unique. This game gets hard, but it's so inventive without ever straying too far from the core gameplay. Occasionally, we mix things up with minecarts or the rocket, but they're the same level of quality. There were times where the action got so intense and so inventive, I actually burst out laughing in appreciation of it. The Country Trilogy's atmosphere also remains intact, remixing some of David Wise's classic tracks and adding some great new songs that are criminally underrated. Music's big for me, which is why I almost went with Jungle Beat, but a single level sealed the deal for me, Sunset Shore. When I got to this level, I was hooked. The graphics changed to this silhouette motif accompanied by a smooth jazz rendition of the Jungle Japes theme. This game knows how to win my favor and how to keep me playing. There's so many hidden collectibles, but the way the menu organizes your findings and teases a secret final level, I'm really motivated to 100% this game. My only gripe, the co-op just doesn't work with this kind of game. Put Diddy on your back and never let him leave. This is a lone banana experience, and I'm just over the moon for it. I don't get as many chances to talk about them, but I love the spectacle-based hack-and-slash kind of games. You know, God of War, Asher's Wrath, I guess you could count Mad World and Red Steel 2. Those games where it's not just if you kill the enemies, but how you kill them. 
and the subgenre was first introduced to me through Devil May Cry. I followed Dante from the very beginning and spent countless hours replaying missions to rack up more points and better ranks. Devil May Cry 1 is rough around the edges, but it's still a great time for me. And Devil May Cry 2... Well, I don't know what happened there. And 3 blows the others out of the water with more balanced difficulty and the introduction of Virgil. 3 is probably the best, but I actually prefer Devil May Cry 4 for the shiny graphics and the completion of Dante's character arc. Well, in reality, Dante's character reached its peak in 3, so by the time he shows up in 4, he's all out of f to give and is just a demon-slaying badass. First, we have to play as Nero, which I hated at first. I don't want to be this whiny little jerk, I want to play as that cocky, self-assured jerk. But Nero's gameplay really grew on me, especially thanks to the Devilbringer, which lets him hookshot to his enemies or pull them towards him all Scorpion-style. When I finally did get my hands on Dante, I almost missed playing as Nero. At least I'd miss it if Dante didn't control better than ever. All of his weapons and styles are here like in Devil May Cry 3, but now he can freely switch between the mid-combo? Yes, please! Nero serves a second purpose, having all the doubt and emotional baggage, freeing up Dante to just be a hilarious badass. It's a pretty good deal, and a great way to end the series. Oh, wait! Yeah, Devil May Cry 5 is out now, and if the rules weren't a thing, it would easily reign supreme, but for now, 4 takes the cake. And with that, there's only one thing left to say. Don't you dare say it, Jackpot! As an ongoing series, Street Fighter might be my favorite franchise when it comes to fighting games. But man, Ryu, you're old. What is this, 1991? How about we get some fresh blood in the genre? The great thing about Skullgirls, well, one great thing about Skullgirls, is the blend of the old and the new. Back in the days of Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat, designers didn't really know how to make fighting games. They kind of stumbled upon it. Remember, the whole concept of chaining attacks together was the result of a glitch. But now, the kids who grew up loving these games are old enough to design them, and they're putting all that love back into the product armed with the better knowledge afforded to them by years of R&D. A mostly all-girl cast with bizarre, at times grotesque powers. There's a cat girl who can take off her head, another lady with a killer umbrella, high-concept fighters like Peacock, Big Band, or Valentine, and Double, which looks like a dream I had after I ate a whole chipotle burrito with queso and guac before going to bed. Every frame of every character is hand-drawn. It's beautiful and fresh, but peel back the skin and you'll see the strong sinos of the 90s fighting games it's built upon. Particularly Marvel, Third Strike, and Darkstalkers. The combo game is hectic as always, but the vibrant animation makes it a feast for the eyes. And you can play with up to three characters on your team, and if you and your opponent don't have the same amount of fighters, the game will balance out your health bars accordingly. Plus, there's all these references and quotes from other fighting games. My personal favorite is when they released a palette swap character named Fukua to mock Street Fighter 4's DiCapri. That was awesome. Everything has this 30s film theming to it. Not just peacocking or crazy cartoon attacks, but the music, the HUD, and the announcer. And I really like how it handled the female cast. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of fan service, and I mean a lot of fan service. Seriously, look at this. I'm admittedly not gonna complain too much about that, but then the DLC added a couple of dudes in there, and it wasn't really a big deal. It's just like, hey, all of these characters are awesome. The gender ratio doesn't matter. We just care about how much ass they can kick. And it turns out, it's a lot of ass. I'm obviously listing second Encore for having the most content. Way to go, Reverge Labs, for making an awesome game on such a low budget. And I am seriously looking forward to what they do with Indivisible. Keep an eye on this developer, guys. They got a bright future ahead of them. Alright, alright, show's over. Every one of us from the old Countdown days has those games that we're associated with. Rabbit Luigi has Metal Gear, Zelda, and Spec Ops The Line. Quarter Guy has Mega Man and Arcana Heart. Josh has Dynasty Warriors and My Little Pony. Not a game, but that's what he has. And I became the guy who was always the one to bring up League of Legends. So, I guess I better uphold my reputation. Most online multiplayer games I play are one-on-one, -on -one, i.e. fighting games. You're not gonna catch me in a battle royale anytime soon. But there's something I love about the teamwork in multiplayer online battle arenas. Planning out the perfect five-man team, taking lane as a late-game carry alongside your support, or going solo top knowing that the jungler has your back. TF2 can have coordination like this, splitting up for targets, how the NG places his teleporters, and of course the medic. But it's mostly everyone doing their own thing. 
Here, you have five teammates with various spells and skills, timing them to turn the tides of a team fight and push ahead to the next tower. Finding combinations is a joy, like having Blitzcrank pull an opponent into your AoE ultimate, knocking a target skyward so that Yasuo can airstrike them, Soraka popping that global heal at just the right time, or diving in front of Caitlyn's sniper shot to defend your squishy mage while they flee. Every match has a dozen of these game-sharing moments that gives a rush I just can't find anywhere else. Of course, there's the inevitable toxicity that comes from this level of play, which is why I don't play ranked anymore. But League has a few features that at least try to mitigate it. It doesn't have the creep deny like Defense of the Ancient has for one thing. I don't know about you guys, but I've always hated that. I'm not saying League's the best MOBA out there, but it's the best for me, thanks to my favorite feature, the lore. I know the plot doesn't matter in a game like this, any MOBA would just write a flavored paragraph for each character and call it a day, but over the years, Riot's built this massive universe around its 100 plus champions, multiple city-states, factions, and within those states, alliances, relationships, and backstories, all of this informs the personalities of these champions. It's the same kind of characterization that endeared me to TF2. When I pick Lee Sin, I'm not just playing a no mana assassin with an approach, an AoE, and a knockback. I'm also playing as the humble monk, disgraced from the school of magic for reaching too far, who immolated himself in penance, and lost his sight for what he believes in. He fights for Ionia, that puts him at odds with champions like Katarina or Swain. Oh, and the other team has Udir, Lee Sin's pupil. That's interesting! Is any of this still canon? Nope. Yeah, Riot started updating the lore and rewriting a lot of the continuity I'd grown attached to. Not too happy about that, but to be fair, the new stuff they add is pretty darn cool too. So, Lee characters show up in my countdowns a lot, of course they do. There's a character for every occasion, and they're usually really interesting. If I ever want to do a top 10 Minotaurs, top 10 Fencers, or top 10 versions of Sun Wukong, I know where I can find at least one entry. It's been almost a decade since I started playing League of Legends, and I still play it on a regular basis today. And I cannot deny how much this game affected me on how I view storytelling. GG League of Legends, well played. Now that we got that out of the way, it's time to finally talk about my favorite fighting game. We've parried, we've hadokened, and we've taken you for a ride, but now, we Ultra Combo. Killer Instinct, Killer Instinct 2015. Talk about loving a game's cast. KI may not have 150 characters like League, because that would be stupid, but it's like the roster was populated by everything a 10 year old thinks is cool. Can we have a pirate? How about a ninja? Oh, and a dinosaur. Werewolf? Vampire? Alien? A hot chick? A hot dude? A viking? Cyborg? Robot? And that girl from the ring? Things got really crazy in Season 3. Characters from Halo, Gears of War, and Battletoads somehow found their way in, and it's awesome. A lot of these got carried over from the original Killer Instinct, and while the first game was an awesome arcade fighter, I always got the feeling that it was amazing by accident. Like, the developers didn't really know what they were doing, but got lucky? As a fighting game, it's rough around the edges, but it has its own self-indulgent style, and you gotta love that voice yelling, ULTRA COMBO! The 2015 reboot came in at a time when fighting games were going strong, but really needed a fresh perspective. Street Fighter 4 was kinda slow and footsie, and Marvel 3 was Rock Attack, as I mentioned earlier. Killer Instinct 2015, to my shock and amusement, is one of the smartest design fighters I've ever seen. Implementing a combo system about more than just how much damage you can do. When you chain attacks, there's a meter that fills up until your opponent spins out of your combo, meaning you can't just stun lock them into infinity. It's up to you to put a finisher in your combo before you drop it. Do you choose the finisher that does more damage, the one that gets you more meter for your specials, or the one that repositions them for another potential combo? Decide quickly, because not only does chaining require really quick input, your opponent can initiate a combo breaker by correctly guessing if you're going to punch light, medium, or heavy in your next string. That means besides thinking about your placement and correctly hitting the buttons, you have a Rochambeau mind game going with your foe mid-combo. And if you're on the receiving end, you're not completely helpless if you walk into a Jago sword spree. Character models are big, time is short, and everything is screaming go go go! This is a very aggressive fighting game. 
there's tons of rushdown characters and even the zoners are extremely offensive. You can't be a wallflower in this game, you're in it to win it. That might explain why Agonos is so low tier, but goodness gracious he is fun to play. Finish it off with a string of rhythmic hits, which the soundtrack actually harmonizes with? Yeah, the sound direction in this game is on point. If I were good enough to go to EVO, this is the game I'd be playing. Give me Saber Wolf and watch me go to town. Hyrule Warriors. This could be an issue. I love this game, but I don't want to count it as my Zelda entry. I recall Josh Scorcher having a similar conundrum during his top 50, only in his case, he's also a huge Dynasty Warriors fan, and ended up counting Hyrule Warriors as neither a Zelda nor a Dynasty entry. I think I'm gonna do the same thing, though in my case, my favorite Dynasty Warriors didn't crack the top 50. I like Koei's one-man army simulators a lot, but with so many similar entries, all of these ancient Chinese brouhaha's kind of run together for me. Here in Hyrule, you get the same overpowered gameplay, plus it shamelessly panders to my inner Zelda fanboy. Seriously, not even Nintendo themselves would reach for some of these references. Link can finally use the strength of the Golden Gauntlets offensively, Ruto gets carried into battle like in Jabu Jabu's belly, and oh my god, Darunia does the dance! And that's just the Ocarina of Time stuff. The original release on the Wii U stuck mostly to Ocarina, Twilight Princess, and Skyward Sword, and I'd say that was enough for a full game. But if you're gonna check it out, go for the Definitive Edition on the Switch, which collects everything from the DLC of the original and the 3DS version. Toon Link can summon the train from Spirit Tracks, Marin from Link's Awakening shows up, the King of Hyrule turns into a boat and runs people over, goodness I love this franchise! And you know who else loves this franchise? Sia, the game's main villain. While little more than an excuse plot, the Legend Mode is enough of an excuse to get into some missions, try a bunch of different characters, and see some interesting, if extremely dumb, plot turns. I love how Sia is basically just a fangirl gone mad with power, and the other new characters like Volga fit right into this non-canon, over-the-top version of Hyrule. The controls are simple enough that you can pick up any character and go on a power trip, but there's enough diversity in each warrior that you'll probably find yourself a few favorites. Impa with the Naginata, please! And if Legends isn't enough for you, hop into this game's nine adventure maps. You'll never need another game again. You're kind of grinding missions at this point, which a lot of people won't really care for, but for me, the tiny awards you get along the way, from weapons and costumes to crafting items and experience points, it got me hooked. Hard. I'd still be working on it if I didn't get distracted by other games, and every now and then I'll pop it back in and make some progress towards that un fathomable 100% completion. The Legend of Zelda is my favorite franchise of all time, so we'll be seeing it again on this list, but for celebrating a series so dear to me with some rocking tunes and mook annihilating gameplay, I tip my green cap to Hyrule Warriors. It's not dangerous to go alone. Just keep hitting X. Don't worry, loves, the cavalry's here! It might surprise some of you that I like Overwatch more than League of Legends or Team Fortress 2, given my track record. But guys, if this game came out back during those years when I was churning out countdowns every few weeks, Overwatch would be all over this channel! I think part of why I like Overwatch so much is that it's really a blend of those two games, a TF2-style shooter by way of League of Legends. 
Do I have to explain? Well, I'm going to anyways. You have your objective-based battlegrounds with you defending a point or pushing a cart, and it's a cel-shaded first-person shooter with a cartoon style not unlike TF2. The animated trailers that come out regularly even remind me of the Meet the Videos, but the way the characters are handled, having a set of abilities and an ultimate, a detailed backstory and relationships with select other characters, releasing a new one every once in a while, it's very League. Or any MOBA, I suppose, but not since League have I fallen in love with a universe so quickly. At least a universe that has so little to do with the actual gameplay. Like League, all the lore about Omnix and the return of an international super team, it doesn't actually come into play in the matches. You can go ahead and put Overwatch member Genji on a team with his estranged brother, three villainous Talon members, and a hamster. He won't have any complaints. But the lore gives context to the characters and makes me enjoy stepping into their shoes. Again, not every game can have 150 characters like League, but it's amazing how many different playstyles this cast gives you. Soldier 76 plays like a Call of Duty pro while Pharaoh rocket jumps like the TF2 soldier. Reaper is like playing the darkness. Lucio parkours all mirrors edge like to get to friends he can buff. You got your healers, you got your snipers, a ton of characters who put up shields, and D.Va throwing her entire mech suit at people. I'll admit that like League of Legends, it's easy to find some unhappy campers in the annals of Team Builder, so try to play with friends if you can. But for the most part, I love this community, which is what earns Overwatch so high a station on my list. It's like Blizzard crystallized fandom culture, sifted out the bad stuff and engineered a bunch of characters you're guaranteed to fall in love with. This game got big around the same time I started regularly cosplaying at conventions, and I've even cosplayed Reaper at a pool party once. And my time with these fellow Overwatchers is something I wouldn't trade for the world. It's one of those games that continues improving my life, even when I'm not playing it. Even if half of it is done by the fans, it wouldn't be possible without the game itself. Then again, it did help start the loot box craze. I'm not letting that slide, Blizzard. Just because you're not as bad as other people doesn't make it okay.